my name is Sandy Swirsky, and I am the uh, chairperson of the Antiques Group for San Jose Women's Club. And today we're presenting a program by Darlene Tennis about the Castro women. Hi, I'm Darlene Tennis from Casa Q, and today we're going to be learning about the Castro women and California history. Please enjoy yourself. Okay. All right, uh, this is Darlene Tennis. Her mother, Lily, has been a member of the Women's Club for quite a long time, right? And Darlene has started coming to the antiques meeting. Okay, well, we'll discuss that later. <laughs> but she offered to do this presentation. Look, Darlene Tennis. Tennis, and I have, um, you can put it, I don't think that's the first uh, slide. Oh, really? Okay. okay. Mind the way? So, um, my name is Darlene Tennis again. I have a business called Casa Q. I know a lot of you guys found out about, how many of you guys found out about it because of Casa Q? Because of, yeah, okay. So, um, you know, I like to share the Latino history a lot, so that's why I wanted to come here today and do that. My mother is a member of this club, like she said. She also was married here. She had a wedding. She was married at the cathedral downtown, and she had her wedding reception here in 1955. So she's married for 62 years, and my parents, that's my dad getting coffee, and my mom would check you in. <laughs> so those are my parents. Um, so let me get started with the Castro women. I got intrigued with the Castro family um, because they're so embedded in the history in California. And go ahead, I was going to do mine, but it's not done. You want me to do it? Yeah, go to the next slide. So the story of California can't be told without mentioning the Castro. If you think about it, Castroville, Castro District in San Francisco, Castro Street in um, Mountain View, There's we have Castro schools that are named here. We have Castro everywhere. You don't really think about it sometimes, but there's Castro everywhere if you think about it, and you will now. But So there were 70 Castro ranches, both Spanish and Mexican land grants, that were here in California. And the Castro family at one time owned almost a quarter of the land in Santa Cruz County, and 10% of the land privately held in California. So they were huge landowners. But before I start getting into the Castro women, I need to take you back in history a little bit to the next slide and talk about you know, how we started in California. So of course in California we have um, the indigenous people in California. And they lived here in this beautiful paradise of the land for, for a go to the next slide. I'm like doing my slides here. <laughs> Um, so, so this is like a, a depiction of California back when nobody, just the indigenous people lived here. Um, so go ahead and go to the next slide. So there was roughly, for about 15,000 to 17,000 years, they lived here untouched uh, by other civilizations, okay? So a third of the indigenous people were living here in California, because of course it's a great place to live, right? And they spoke many, many, many languages, and they had tribes of about 50 to 500 people. They mostly ate acorns, and they ate what was on the land. They didn't do a lot of agriculture, okay? So they ate fish, shellfish, deer, <coughs> elk, antelope, grass seed, insects, lots of berries. But acorn was a really big part of their diet. So go ahead, the next slide. So these are the uh, map of the native um, areas in the U.S., okay? So this has nothing to do with property lines, okay? This has nothing to do with um, country lines. This has to do with where certain tribes. Now within these tribes, like say we have the Great Basin in Southwest in California, there's multiple, multiple, multiple um, tribes within there, but they're kind of grouped in this way. So as you can see at that time, California was considered one big long strip, okay? So California, so we had California. So go ahead and go to the next slide. So European exploration. So apparently I forgot this slide. So, <laughs> so um, you know, there was a lot of people that came. Oh, sorry. There was a lot of people that, go Wait, ahead and no, keep no, it on that. Get, see if it was in the next. No, no go ahead and keep it on the European slide, the blank slide, I'm okay with that. 
trying to find it again. Okay, so I'll just talk <laughs> so that you're going the wrong way. You're going the wrong way. I was going the so the, um, so the European exploration, um, okay, so you're, yeah, okay, go, go, go. Uh, okay, almost back, almost back. <laughs> now you guys saw my whole presentation, I'm done. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you, you're welcome. So the European exploration, um, there was a lot of people that came to California, but mostly the Spanish, there was a lot of Russians that came here, there was English, Irish people. So there was a lot of um, exploration that happened, including the Portola expedition, the De Anza parties, and all that. So we'll go to the next one. Actually, if you see, I have a question mark on it. I have a question mark on a lot of the dates. Because when you look at California history, um, it, it always talks about Alta California history, okay, and not Baja. And at this time, it was all one land. So I kind of erase those dates that a lot of people <laughs> say for California history because I consider it one piece of land because it was one piece of land at that time. Okay, so the, one of the first explorers was Fortun Jimenez. Now I put Jimenez with the J there, but it's spelled with the X or a J as some of you know that speak Spanish. Um, so Fortun Jimenez, he was a pilot of the ship Concepcion. It was brought by Hernan Cortes. He came along in New Spain and he went um, he went in search of the island of California, because at that time they thought it was an island. So he led a mutiny, which means he took over the ship, and then they landed on the southern tip of Baja California, which is La Paz. Um, when they landed on the land, they got in a scuffle fight with the uh, natives that were there, and he was killed. So the survivors came back, and they, they talked about these beautiful black pearls that they found. So this kind of prompted people to come to California. So the next, so he's the first one, and that was in 50, uh, 1533. <coughs> Actually, go back to the last slide real short. For, go back to the last slide. And then, the, so, so, so 1533, and 1542 is when other people say exploration started. So, okay, so go ahead, and then go to the next one. So then we have Hernan Cortez. So Hernan Cortez discovered Baja California. You know, the Gulf of California is called the Sea of Cortez, right? So he was a Spanish conqueror. He, he conquered the mainland of Mexico. And in conquering the mainland of Mexico, um, he, he then took it under Spanish rule then. So that's when Mexico became Spain. So he wouldn't have done this without Doña Maria, or La Malinche, as she's, uh, many people call her in Mexico. And so La Malinche, La Malinche was, a, uh, was an Indian, and she acted as an interpreter, an advisor, a mistress to him, and she gave birth to his, her first son. Their, their first son was considered the first mestizo of Mexico, which means the first mixed race. So a mestizo is a mixed race person. So they always say that Martin was the first mestizo that was born. So La Malinche, she has, um, there's a love-hate relationship with La Malinche in Mexico. Some people feel that she was a traitor to her people, that because she helped Hernan Cortez take over things, she gave him information, and she spoke three, at least three languages that we know. She, she spoke Nahual, she spoke Maya, and she spoke Spanish. And so she was very important because there wasn't anybody that was speaking all those languages at the time. And, and whenever you see um, pictures of them, paintings of them, at that time that were done by both the Spaniards and indigenous people, they always show her in great prominence. They always show her right next to him or even in front of him. So we feel that she had a very strong presence, this woman. And so, but some people, some of the indigenous people felt that she betrayed their people and that they, that's how come Mexico took them over. Other people feel that she saved a lot of bloodshed because it would eventually would have been taken over anyways and that she saved a lot of bloodshed. So when you say a La Malinche or you say somebody's La Malinche, it's like saying they're a Benedict Arnold or something for, in English terms. And you're saying that they're a traitor, okay? So, so there's mixed um, feelings about her. So the, on the next slide, I just thought I would throw the statue up since we discuss statues a lot these days in <laughs> San Jose. This is a statue that was put up in Mexico and it represents Hernan Cortez, La Malinche, and their son Martin. Um, so Martin has been knocked out 
asked many times. Um, this statue had to be moved. I think it's been moved twice now because of protests, uh, because of it. So I think a lot of us here know about San Jose statues and protests, so it doesn't happen just here. <laughs> it happens elsewhere as well. So then we'll go to the next slide. So then we have Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo, um, and that's his name in Portuguese. He was a Portuguese um, sailor, but he was under the Spanish crown. And so Cabrillo and his men found that there was essentially nothing for the Spanish. So he came here and he saw these indigenous people and they didn't have, they were just in huts and they were living off the land and they were eating acorns and shellfish. And he's like, I'm Span, I'm like from Europe. I don't like these acorns and I don't like the food that they eat here. <laughs> he goes, and there's no settled, there's no real people that live here. There's no settlements. He's like, I don't, it's rugged. There's too many trees. There's too many mountains to scale. I don't like this place, okay? So he came back and he says, he found California to be of very little interest, okay? He hasn't seen the housing cost right now. <laughs> But so it would be virtually left unexplored and unsettled for the next 234 years, okay? So then Sir Francis Drake came about. He was the English explorer and a privateer. So a privateer, I actually have a whole talk on pirates um, that I did, because I do talk sometimes on uh, cruise ships, and I did this whole talk on private. And so privateers, the difference between a private and a privateer is really nothing more than one is flying over a flag, okay? So one is being um, sailing a ship under the flag of England or Spain or whatever country is sending them out. They're still taking over other ships, pilfering, stealing, doing whatever. They're doing the same thing. It's just one's doing it for a king or a queen and the other ones are doing it for themselves. So pirates are really more entrepreneurial. <laughs> um, so Sir Francis Drake, he flew under the British flag, his ship. He captured two Spanish treasure ship, ships in the Pacific. And then he claimed Nova Albion, which is all in North America, 42 degrees south as Spanish, from sea to sea. So everything, which is about, about halfway down the United States, is 42. So everything below that is what he claimed. Everything above that, he felt that, um, I think it was in, uh, or I'm sorry, everything above that, because everything below that, Spain and Mexico had kind of claimed. So everything above that. So Nova Albion, Albion is a, is a is an ancient word for the, the island of Great Britain. So he was calling it the new Great Britain, basically. Okay, so, um, so the claims were disputed, and then, of course, Native Americans were never consulted <laughs> that they took over their land, right? So, or that they claimed their land. So it's then on the next slide. So this is a, this is a slide of the island of California. Um, so this was a, a famous map that was done in 1656. And then that shows um, Nuevo Mexico, Canada, and there's, uh, 1656, yeah, there was, U.S. is little over there. France, remember, because France was part of uh, uh, um, Texas, where the little Texas thing is, that's when Texas was part of France. Um, can it, we're not going to talk about Texas, but Texas has interesting history. So, so go to the next slide now. So, so the whole concept of this island of California, okay? So Spanish author, Garci Rodriguez de Montalvo, he wrote a book called Las Cercas de Esplandian. And he wrote about this mythical island of California and Queen um, Califia. And there were these beautiful Amazon women, and they lived here on this island in California. And so when the Spanish explorers came out, this was a very popular book, and they found that California was an island. They said, this must be California. So they named the island California. So that's how California got its name. Um, Stanford University has a very good collection of maps, of the island of California maps. There were 800 of them. And it was classified as an island until 1774. So that's a really long time that people thought it was an island. Okay. So you have to remember that when people are coming to discover California, that they thought it was an island. So go ahead. Especially when you think of the De Anza. This, I, I just threw this in there. That picture that I got of the Queen Khalifa happens to come from Disneyland. <laughs> this is a mural that's at Disneyland talking about the um, discovery of California. So, and then we have the Spanish missionaries that come, of course. So the Spanish missionaries came in, as you saw, there was up to like 300,000 indigenous people that were here, but within a very short period of time, 
Um, it, it went down to about 10,000, and that's because of the disease that was brought in uh, that they were not accustomed to, these uh, European diseases. They also brought things in, because they didn't like that Indian food, remember? Um, they brought in cows, um, horses, they brought in, in um, what else do we eat, pigs. They brought in all these livestock, and with the livestock came a lot of disease that they were unaccustomed to. And they also brought in other things like wheat, um, so, because wheat, so that they could make, um, host for communion, and they brought in things like um, the wine the vineyards, of course, this is why we have the Napa Valley vineyards from the original Mission grapes, right? So they brought in all this stuff so that they can make it more European way of living, and that's when they're baptizing one of the childs. Go ahead. And so the Jesuit order was charged with converting the native people of California to Catholicism and the European style of living. So the Jesuit missionary um, I cannot, it, it, my dad told me how to say this. <laughs> how do you say it? Eusebio. Eusebio Francisco Quino. Um, so that was in 1683. Again, when you're looking at our, when you're looking at California history, they normally don't mention this. They mention Father Hindebro Serra, right? But he's really the first one that came to California, okay? So um, he, he, and he went through, Janice is an old New Mexican that's here, Janice. <laughs> she comes from old New Mexican um, families that were there for centuries. And he went through New Mexico, he went through uh, New Mexico, um, Arizona, and Baja. He went through and he, did, he, and he, he established 24 missions and vistas. So he's also the one, because he went by land, he proved that California was not an island. So they finally said, he's like, I didn't have to go over any water. It's not an island, people. <laughs> so he, oh, wait, actually go back for one second. I forgot to mention, he settled on Mission San Bruno in 1684. Um, but, but because the, there was, you know, this is down at the tip of Baja, California. If any of you guys have been down there, it's like desert. So they didn't have, they couldn't get enough water, enough supplies down there, and so they abandoned their work. So that mission really didn't uh, take, so to speak. So that, go to the next slide. And then mission de Nuestra Señora de Loreto Concho <laughs> was the first permanent mission in California. It was founded on October 15, 1697 by Jesuit Friar Juan Maria Salvatierra. So after a power dispute with Charles III in Spain, the Jesuits were kicked out. Because you know those Jesuits are always causing problems, right? <laughs> so they were expelled, they were sent back to, to Spain. And then the Franciscans came, and so a lot of us know about the Franciscan missionaries here, but we tend to forget about the Jesuits that were here. The Franciscans replaced the Jesuits and established one more mission in Baja, California, and then 21 missions in Alta, California. So the 21 missions are the ones you're most familiar with here that are in Alta, California. So, um, so this is a map of the mission. So there's 21 missions, and, and that's just California, but it should say Alta, California, missions. Uh, those are the 21 missions in Alta, California, and these are the 27 missions that were in Spanish, missions in Baja, California. Now, when I'm saying Alta and Baja, again, you have to remember it was still one piece of land, okay? So, um, but those are the many missions. How many of you know, didn't know about the missions in Baja, California? A lot of you, see. So go ahead and um, switch it. So this is a, another random slide. <laughs> so actually, I'm going to skip this slide. But there was a Spanish colonial period um, where, the, where the Spaniards came in. So it wasn't just a mission, but the other Spaniards and stuff came in to think. Part of it was the Anza expedition, which happened in 1775 to 1776. I believe it started out in October, and then they... Um, arrived in Maine, and so it was. Quite, it was a while um, that they were on this exhibition. Go to the next slide. Um, so this is, you know, during the time of our American Revolution on the other side of the continent, right? Then the Anza, that the Spanish were colonizing California. So they led. So um, Colonel Juan Baptista de Anza. Um, went on a 1900 epic journey. It was 1900 miles. Now you have to understand there was no roads. 
<laughs> there was no quick stops along the way or, you know what I mean? This was unchartered territory that they went. And they went all on land. And they re went with families because they wanted to populate California. They were coming here to start colonies, to populate. So they recruited um, 42 men, 39 women, eight of which were pregnant, and 119 children, mostly from Culiacan, Mexico. So the, co the, the colonists were ethnically diverse mix of Spanish, Native American, and African heritage. So those of you that have taken your ancestry DNA test and you're wondering why you have some of these little things in there, <laughs> could be why. Um, so Anza was located on the original site for Presidio de San Francisco. He, so he located the sites. So he located the site for San Francisco, Mission to San Francisco, Mission to Santa Clara, and, this, and here, the city of San Jose, Pueblo de San Jose de Guadalupe, which is the name of our city. Um, so he located the sites, but they didn't settle them yet. They were settled by other people. So this is a map of the Anza expedition. Um, and so you can see where the little dots are on the right side over there, that's where they kind of collected people along the way. And then they started the official expedition on the solid line. And so that is a very long trek, if you can imagine. That is like the size of, you know, two, like a trip from San, I mean, that's a long way, okay. So they have, you can actually go on, the, they have a historic tr trail and you can go on it. It's now 1,200 miles, it's not 1,900 because they have roads, we have roads now. Um, and they kind of went, you know, off to the side, so it's a little bit. But there, you can't actually take this trip, they have a whole trip thing. So go ahead and go to the next slide. So now we're getting to the Castros, okay? So this is where the Castros come in. So Joaquin Isidro de Castro uh, was born in Villa de Sinaloa, Sinaloa, Mexico in 1732 under Spanish rule, okay? So him and his wife, Maria Martina Bautier, um, she was, her family was from France and they were actually ex uh, escaped France during the Dutch something and and they went to Spain, and then they went to, they went to Mexico, and then she married Joaquin. So they decided to go ahead and join the Anza expedition. So that's how the Castros ended up in California, okay? They came along with eight children, and she gave birth to one children, one child along the way, okay? If you could, so I don't even know, like, there's people that can't even handle driving across town with seven kids, okay? So... <laughs> <laughs> Much less going on a 1,900-mile trek, right? So their son, um, Jose Joaquin Castro, was six years old when he arrived in California, and then he is the father of Maria Martina Castro. Joaquin died in 1801 at San Carlos Mission in California. Next slide. So his wife, whose family, like I said, originated in France, was born about 1733, and she married him in 1754. So a, sol a soldado de cuero is um, a leather, it's when they had those leather outfits that they wore, the leather soldier outfits. And most of them were, um, were mestizos or indigenous, or they were different um, things. And then um, she came with her seven children, and then as we should say, she had the eighth child on the on, on route, and then she had her ninth ch child once she they settled in here. So the first census on a census, they, this is what they listed because this was the first census in in San Jose was in 1777, and they listed these things. They also in, listed as their property the Indian farmhand horses, you know, mules, mares, oxen, cows, calf, ewes, and goats, so they have a lot there. So next one. So this I got off of Ancestry.com, by the way, because somebody in their family started building this up. So if you can see on the very left side, that's Joaquin Isidro Castro and Maria Martin. They're the ones that came on the Anza expedition. Then you have Jose Joaquin Castro. Okay. Oh, no, wait, 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 wait. Um, so he's the one that was six years old when he came over here, okay? He married Maria Antonio Amador, who gave birth to Maria Martina Castro. So now, when you're looking at the, and I'm gonna, so I just want you to take a look at this really deeply. Can all of you guys see this clearly? No? Okay, well let me tell you this right now. You got Jose Maria, Jose Maria, <laughs> Maria, 
Francisco Maria, 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 Juan. There's a, like all their kids' names start with Maria, okay? <laughs> so when you're looking up history of the Castros, it gets a little difficult unless they, if they, especially if they didn't put their middle names or their date next to it because everybody's Maria. Like the grandmother's Maria, the mother's Maria, then she had like, you know, all these Maria kids, right? So it, get, it becomes very difficult to try to find the information because everybody's names are extreme, are very similar. So, so again, so those are the grandparents. They came over on the Anza expedition as well as Jose. He was six years old. And then I'm gonna go back to he married Maria Antonia Amador and she gave birth to Maria Martina Castro, who we're talking about today. He also, um, she, um, she died and then he married Rosalia Briones and they gave, gave birth to more. So you can see the little arrows I put in there, Martina's dad and Carmela's mom, okay? So Jose Joaquin Castro, he was a six-year-old that came with his family from Sinaloa, Mexico on the Anza expedition. Um, he received Rancho San, San Andres, uh, you know, really 8,911 acre Mexican land grant in 1833 um, by, by the governor, Jose Figueroa, sorry. Something. So between like 17, what year is that? 17, 1833. So, so this was, yeah, so the Grant Santa Cruz County Center from La Selva Beach to Watsonville and the Rancho San Andres Castro Adobe is a historic landmark built by his son on the site. So it wasn't this, that adobe, which I'm going to show you in the next slide, was not necessarily built by Jose, but when his son took over the property, he built it. After serving as a soldier for 13 years, um, Castro came with his wife, Amador, to settle the new community of Villa de Brancaforte. Do any of you guys know the Brancaforte area? And yeah, I have, one of my friends happens to live on Brancaforte in Santa Cruz. Um, so she bore 12 children, and including their daughter, Maria, we're gonna talk about in 1807. After Amador died, he married Briones, and she bore him three more children. Then Castro died of smallpox in 1838. Okay, so this is the adobe that still it still stands in, in, in over there in Monterey area. Um, it's in Watsonville actually. So it was there were very few two-story adobes that were built at that time, um, and this is the only one that I have seen actually. But it was a two-story hacienda, had a spacious fandango room on the second floor, and one of the original cocinas and uh, which is the kitchen and again it was very rare to have a two-story so this one still still exists actually um it's a historical landmark and that's about it so go ahead next slide so via Br brinca forte so i'm going to talk about this because this is another thing that people don't talk about a lot which is it was a civil set settlement so normally most of the settlements here in California that we discuss is the Spanish missionaries coming over here and the missions. But there were actually some civil set settlements that were done as well. So this was one of them. And another one was Los Angeles and San Jose here was a civil settlement. This was not a mission um, that was here. So they were, and they were overshadowed with predominant missions. So life at the villa was very different from the missions because the missions was run by the by the um, priests, of course, or the monks or whoever. And they were, and they were you know, get, doing daily prayers and they had them doing certain work and they had them you know, really like on a schedule and they weren't any fun, okay. So in the villas, <laughs> they were having all kinds of fun in the villas, okay. They were having fiestas and fandangos and they were having bear and bullfights and they were gambling. And oh, those missionaries, they did not like those village people, okay? <laughs> they didn't like those people in the via because they were just, you know, those heathens, right? So they were, they, some of, they went to church too, a lot of them, but they didn't like the life that they were living over there. Um, so they, the, this particular one, Via Branca Forte, where you see many of the Castros were born, because prior to that, many of the um, Californios were born in missions. But the Castros were predominantly born in Via Brancaforte. Okay, so it had a separate identity until 1850. And then it was later called Spanish Town, and now it's East Santa Cruz. So basically, like when you're on the board rock right there, you see that in the little bridge that's right there? On the other side of the bridge, that's all Via Brancaforte right there. <coughs> so this is a map, again, of um, Spain. 
Okay, this is when, when Spain owned it. So if you see, um, it says, I can't even see, so I don't know how many people can see. <laughs> but I think the main part that you should see is, see the green part, you see where California is right there? And then you see that whole big green part right there on the, that's connected? That's California, okay? So at that time, that was California, that they considered all of California. So it, said, um, so it says it says New California there up there, Southwest of New California. So it included a large part of the United States at one time. And this is during Spanish rule, okay, of Mexico, because this was Mexico under Spanish rule. So you have to, so go ahead. Um, those are other, they're called um, inter, um, inter, intedensia, intedensias or something like that. And they're like, they're like regions, okay? So it's all Mexico, but they're, they have different named regions. Okay. All right. So it's hard for me to see what the names are, but you, you, some of them are San, San Luis Postal was a region and New Mexico was a region. So there were different regions and they were like different counties or something. That's what they were. And then they had somebody in charge of each of the area. So there was one person at that time in charge of that whole California area. But again, there weren't that many people there at that time either. So go ahead. So this is where you can see the, the words a little bit more. That's Spanish, Louisiana. So um, remember Texas and Spain, there's a lot of stuff that was going on there. That's why. That's why the, um, the, the theme park is called Six Flags of Six Flags of Texas, because there were six country flags that flew over Texas. And if somebody can name that to you, I'll give you guys a free ornament. Okay, so Nueva Mexico, I mean Nueva California, as you can see, is right there. So it's that whole section. And now I can see it a little bit better. There's Nueva Mexico, Nueva Navarra, Nueva Vizcara. Texas lines are always changing because of, depending on who owned it at the time. Um, but this is during 1810, okay? So go ahead and s switch it. So, and then Mexican independence. So in 1821, Mexico achieved its independence from Spain, and California came under the control of the Mexican government. In 1833, the act of secularization replaced the Catholic Church's authority with that of the Mexican government. So what happened at that time was all, because the Catholic Church owned a lot of property in California because they owned all those missions, right? All down California, <laughs> Alta and Baja. They owned, Catholic Church owned a lot. And so when Mexico came in, they took all that away from the Catholic Church. And then they started handing out. So during the Spanish uh, land grant period, and now I'm just referring to California at this time, from 1784 to 1821 is when there were 30 Spanish land grants that were given. And some of them, the Castros received one too, as you saw. So they were connected to Spain. Now the Spanish land grants at the time, they were still held by the, by the crown. So even though you were getting the land, technically the Spain still kind of owned it. You know what I mean? You weren't really getting the land. Um, Spain owned it. But when the Mexico came about, then they started giving grants to individuals. Okay, so the Mexican land grants in California was from 1833 to 1846, and there was about 270 land grants given. A lot of that land was the mission properties. So those of you that are really into mission history know that many of the missions went into disrepair and they were in rubble, and if you look at a lot of the old pictures, they're just like in horrible shape. Horrible, horrible shape. Carmel Mission was just like just walls, and there was it was a it was a mess. And then because they did because they took the property away from the Catholic Church, so nobody was taking care of those properties anymore. So for a long time, they just they sat vacant or they got tore up or taken apart to build other things. Um, and then actually. Okay, so then the designation Las Californias was revived, reunited all town Baja California. So they were always still, they're always still one property, but they were split, like if we split Northern and Southern California. They were split, but they were still all of Spain and Mexico. So, but they, but they changed to Las Californias. Okay, so go ahead. 
So this is a map of Mexico in 1827. Again, you see the big part of California, right? And the whole California all the way down. Um, go ahead and switch it again. So, the, and then this is when Maria Martina Castro Lodge comes in. So she was born in Villa Branca Forti in 1807 under Spanish rule. So there's a lot of stuff that happened during her lifetime because there was a big changes in California, as you see. And I know it's really confusing. It would have been even more confusing if I hadn't put the history. <laughs> but you know what I mean? It's very, because there was so much chaos going on in California. So in 1824, she married Lieutenant um, Simon Cota. He was a Spanish soldier and he died six years later. Nobody knows why he died. There, I, I haven't been able to find anything. But she had four children and one of them was Carmelita Castro. She was born in 1827. So my, she then married Michael Lodge when 34 and she was about 23. He's, he came from Ireland, he came off of Ireland, um, a whaling ship, and he became a naturalized Mexican citizen because this is now after Mexican rule, right? Because 1821. So he became a naturalized Mexican citizen. He got his Mexican citizenship. He encouraged her well, so this is when they started handing out all the land grants again, okay? And so all her brothers were getting land grants, and she was like, oh, I get a land grant too, right? So she was one of the first women, some people say she was the first woman, I haven't been able to verify that, that got a land grant. Um, and her, Michael Lodge encouraged her to get a land grant as well at the time, of course. Um, so, because they knew that was a way to gain property. So they went a year later in 1831 and they added more children to her thing. So go ahead, next one. So this, this is from, so UC Santa Cruz did a long interview with one of the, um, she was like in her 80s and this interview was done in 1965 and it was done with Carrie Lodge, who is a granddaughter of Martina, okay? So, and so she was already in her 80s, and she started talking about, so it's, a, you can, it's on audio, actually, but I was read the transcript. So this family tree was made up by what she said. It's actually incorrect, <laughs> um, because you know people in our family, they don't know what's going on, right? If you start asking people in the family what happened at the dinner table last week, they, you'll have five different stories, okay? So that's kind of how it is, right? Stories get passed down, and depending on who's telling the story, it's different. But so she has, again, we have Isidro, Joaquin, Martina, who married Simon Corta, Michael Lodge, and then she marries um, Louis de Beau, who's a French guy. She gives birth to Carmen, but this says that Carmen was Michael Lodge's daughter. He, she was actually um, Simon Corta's daughter. So, so, but that's from um, what they did. Okay, so the, so, but that, other than that is, you can see that Martina gave birth to a lot of children, okay? <laughs> she, gave, she gave birth to a lot of kids. Um, and so go ahead, go to the next one. So this is a Castro uh, adobe that again, still, it's called the Castro Noble adobe now. And this still stands too um, in Monterey. It's a historic landmark. So this is the, one of the buildings that they first lived in, one of their homes that they first lived in. Go ahead. That's a picture of the Noble family though, not the Castros. So she was given Rancho Soquel, Soquel. So it's been called Soquel, Asocales, Soquel. So it was an indigenous word originally, which they believe was Soquel, but then people thought it was Osocal. That's how they wrote it down from the pronunciation that they were hearing. And then eventually it became Socal. But in the paperwork, it actually does say Socal, okay? So Martina Castro received um, 1,660 acres of, of a Mexican land grant in 1834, again from Jose Figueroa. So this is the land grant that you see. When, you, when we're saying Capitola and Socal, it's all that area, but if you see, I don't know if you can see, but all the way up on the top, there's a little right in there, it's Santa Clara County. So her land grant went all the way to Santa Clara County portions of our county. So it was a very, very large land grant. So she applied for the uh, Paula de Yesca grant. So she was complaining that her brother Rafael's cows were, in, were getting, or cows and sheep were getting into her property. So she, 
So she petitioned for more land, and then they gave her 32,702 acres. And they said, okay, well that should keep his cows out, okay? <laughs> so um, that was called the cow augmentation. And so she owned a lot, just think that's acres, okay? That's a lot of property, a lot, a lot of property. She was the, the largest um, land grant owner in, in um, the Monterey Bay area. So go ahead. So with that land, a lot of it, as you know, we're going over the hill, there's a lot of timber there. So they couldn't really build houses and stuff there. So her husband, Michael Lodge, started a sawmill and started doing tinder. And then this is one of the original, they started the first sawmill in Santa Cruz. Um, so this is a picture of the ac of an actual sawmill at that time in Santa Cruz. Go ahead. So the, now we're going to go back to a little history, because now again, all this stuff's going on, right? So we have the California Republic. So Alta, Alta California, as I had mentioned, was being really neglected by Mexico, and they didn't really care. They were worried about their mainland at the time. And everything was just falling apart over here, all the missions and everything. And they were really, but they were concerned about all these immigrants that were coming in, these Yankee immigrants that were coming into California, and and um, and they were and the immigrants were all mad because they couldn't buy land and they couldn't rent or buy land, and, and they were threatening to expel them. Okay, and it's, I don't know if this sounds familiar to anybody, but <laughs> so anyway, so all these immigrants, um, so they really were bothered by all these immigrants coming in, so they wanted to do something about it. So some of these, um, they, they, this is where the Bear Flag Revolt comes in. Um, they kind of came up and they wanted to start their own country. And that is actually the flag that's at the um, Hearst, I think it's at the Her uh, Hearst Museum. Um, so that's a Lone Star, because we were a Lone Star, we were a Lone Star to state for just 25 days though. <laughs> it was short lived and it wasn't recognized, but you know. <laughs> so. Um, just from June 14th to July 9th. And then we got into the war. So go ahead, the next one. So, but at the same time, again, everything's happening at the same time, right? The California Gold Rush was from 1848. And because James Marshall found a gold at Sutter Mill, well, we know what happened then, right? I mean, there's a reason why it's called rush, okay? Because it wasn't, you know, people slowed down. They all rushed over here, right? So. And there was, a, and you have to remember, because they don't show women a lot, there was a lot of women that were there too. Um, maybe not a lot, but there were women that were there too, and that's not shown very much. So go ahead, the next slide. But again, Martina was there, because these Castro women were tough, okay? They went over long places of land, they were tough. And so they went, they picked up their stuff, they picked up their kids, and they went over to, um, I don't know how to pronounce that, Moncalum. McCallamy? McCallamy. I must be the only one in this room that doesn't know how to pronounce it, apparently. <laughs> so they went there, they opened a store and a freighting business because people needed to buy stuff and they needed to ship their stuff in and out, right? So they made money off of all those little gold rushers. Um, they already had money, by the way, but they made more money. Um, so then, and this is the downtown area. So go ahead, next slide. So unfortunately, typhoid, typhoid fever came in as well, and it, and, it, and it took three of her children died at that time. So, so, so once the three children died, um, then Michael said, you know, you should go back home because we don't want the other kids to get sick, right? So go ahead and flip the slide. So, so Martina went back on her own with all her kids back here, traveled from the north to down. And then Michael Lodge, they believe, got help. So he stayed back to close the store and you know, finish up the, the paperwork and whatever they were doing over there. And they believe on the way back, he got robbed and killed. So that's not an actual picture. That's not an actual picture. <laughs> and then we have blankness. So then what happened was, um, yeah, we'll go, let's go back to the blank slide for a second. You want the white one? Yeah. So then what happened is, it's blank, so I'm just going to talk, so now you just have to look at me. So in, in 1849, at the age of 42, Martina remarried again to Louis Dupro. He was 16 years younger than her. She was one of the original cougars, right? So, <laughs> and she married him, uh, this, you know, hot little French guy, right? And, <laughs> but he was in it for another reason, obviously. 
And, um, but she, did, she wanted to marry somebody because she felt like I need to marry a man to protect me because she now, again, during all this time, this is during the gold rush, and as we know, it became the United States, and now everything's in English. Well, she grew up her whole life. It's like if today, like tomorrow, France took us over, and guess what? You guys need to speak French, okay? So she was just lost. She didn't know what to do. She couldn't speak Spanish. They were um, asking her to prove her land grants, and she does, and, and in English, you know? And so she married this man to hopefully help her. He wasn't much help, though. So that none of the kids really liked him or anything. At the same time, the same year, 1849, Carmela, her daughter, marries Thomas Fallon. And some of you guys may know his name, right? So I'm just throwing that in there now. <laughs> and then a lot of their daughters, not just Carmela, but her other daughters were marrying these English-speaking Yankees, right? And all these English-speaking Yankees, that they said, they were wanting to get all the property because this is when you could get the properties, right? Um, so, let's see. So at the time, Fallon, he, got, um, he gathered up all the others. You know what, let's go to the next slide, because we'll go to this. So this is the Bear Flag Revolt um, flag. And this is just prior to Thomas Fallon marrying um, Carmel. Okay, so go to the next slide. Is that Sonoma? That's Sonoma, because the first flag was... was um, Those buildings are still there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, following Mexico's defeat, most of uh, the seated on February 4, 84, I mean 48, excuse me, ending the war and turning to California to the U.S., okay, the same year that the gold was discovered. So, let's go to the next slide. So, somewhere in here, Tom, so, so Carmela Castro Fallon was born in 1827, and then she married Fallon in 1849. So, he was a hotel and saddle shop owner from Santa Cruz. Um, her mother did not like Thomas Fallon. She did not want Carmela to marry Thomas Fallon. She thought he was a scoundrel, that he was a, excuse the, the term, gold digger <laughs> at that time, and just wanted her property, right? Um, so she was not happy of uh, Carmela marrying Thomas Fallon. So there are two, two we'll, we'll talk about Thomas later. Okay, so, so after, um, once her daughters married all these different guys, then Thomas Fallon kind of led the way in getting, trying to get her property from her. So he gathered up all the other son-in-laws and they filed a lawsuit against, against um, Martina, Carmela's mother to get the property taken away. And they say that this ha really broke her heart and put a mental strain on her. So, so there was like, it was uh, split into nine ways and she made sure to leave the French guy out. <laughs> she had already, so it was just, it was split up between all the, the kids. When they split up the property, um, she it was all in English and so she felt very uncomfortable signing it. And so she didn't sign it. But then her little French husband, he signed an X on it, like forged her X signature, and then it went ahead and went through. Um, so there were nine, it was split up into nine things. So the Fallons, so the Carmel and Thomas, this is again Martina's daughter, received 3,400 acres of land, which they sold, and then they moved to San Jose. So as you guys know, the Fallon house down by San Pedro Square. So that was, they came here, they built that house, with Castro money, um, so it should be called the Castro Fallon House, I believe, um, <laughs> since it's Castro money. And they built the house over there, and uh, they lived there until 1876. During this time, Carmel had six children, and they had nine altogether, but three died of cholera. So there was a lot of diseases, of course, back then, and this is prior to penicillin. So go ahead. So Thomas Fallon, um, he was an Irish-born, Canadian-raised American and former mayor of San Jose in 1859. So he joined the Bear Flight Re Revolt. He raised a group of 22 volunteers in Santa Cruz and appointed himself captain. And then he went across Santa Cruz Mountains to capture Pueblo of San Jose without bloodshed on July 11. So when they say without bloodshed, what happened was there was um, the Spaniards were riding their horses along and they were going from place to place trying to protect their thing. Well, he heard that they were here already, so what he did, he stayed to the side and waited it out until they left. 
And then once they left, and he came in here and he raised the flag, okay? So, which is why there was no bloodshed. Um, so, so that's why a lot of people just, uh, you know, there's a lot of people that consider Thomas um, Fallon, most predominantly our former mayor, um, Tom McHenry, is a big fan of Thomas Fallon. So some people feel that he's a hero, and then there's other people that feel he's a louse. So it depends on what side you're on. You know, he was, um, they think he's a louse because they think he was, um, he was a womanizer, he was very charming. Um, he was a, um, they said he, you know, drunk a lot. Some think he was drunk when he raised the flag, you know. He was <laughs> so, you know, but, but he was an opportunist as well, you know. I mean, he wasn't a dummy either. Um, so he did that. Then he raised, he received the flag from Commodore Sloat and then, and then um, raised it over San Jose. So there was already, the flag was already raised twice prior to him in other parts of California, like you were saying and the Sonoma and stuff. So their divorce. So in 1876, after 27 years of marriage, Carmela came home and he was found in a, what the papers called a compromising position with the housekeeper who was Maggie McBride. So Maggie, so she came out there with a the fire poker stick, like a good Latina would, and drove them out. <laughs> And um, she packed up her stuff and took her unmarried kids to San Francisco, okay? She said, that's it, I've had enough of Thomas Fallon, right? She never remarried after that, after her, her taste of Thomas Fallon. She, had, she was found marriage distasteful, and she never married again. So McBride sued Carmel for assault and battery and slander because she felt that she lost her good reputation because this came out in the newspaper and everything. So she did win the loss, lawsuit for assault, but she did not win it for slander, okay? And uh, she was required to pay her $900. Now, $900 is a lot. It's about $20,000 in, in now days. So go ahead. So I actually went to the California room. Are, you, are those of you familiar with the California room? Yeah. Yeah, okay, so this is my little history. So the California room is in the MLK library that's over here, and they have a lot of documents there. Um, 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 history and things like that and you can look at it but you can't check it out okay you have to look at it there and so I took some photos though so I was looking up because it's very hard to find you know unfortunately with women and history people don't write about it a lot you know women are probably too busy doing everything to write about it and then the men don't write about them and so there's a lot of history that's lost about the women in history Unfortunately, in our state, a lot of the historic landmarks, about 90-something percent of them, have to do with men. There's, it's less than, I believe, 5% have to do with women, unfortunately. That'd be a good project for a women's club to work on. <laughs> Get historical landmarks to talk about them. Even like the Fallon House, for instance. But, um, so these were notes that a lot of you historians here will know Clyde Arbuncle. So Clyde Arbuckle was a very popular historian here and he did a lot. So these are notes from him, typewritten and handwritten notes and from a couple other people too, but this is mostly from Clyde Arbuckle. So he wrote about Thomas Fallon and I took a couple pictures. Like one thing he says, the authorities uh, on where San Jose's officially first American flag came from have better get together their facts. He's like, because <laughs> he felt like there was so much, there was so much disagreement on what ha actually happened. Some people didn't even believe that Thomas Fallon raised the flag. Um, some because they felt like, well, nobody saw it. It's not like he did it when everybody was in the plaza or something. And then other people said, no, 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 he did it. He did it. Well, because he was boasting of doing it. So there's a lot of conflicts about things. Go to the next slide. So we're discussing though the, their divorce. So I thought, I'm just gonna take a picture of these and we'll just go over what happened. Because he wrote a lot about their actual lawsuit in here. So they filed a lawsuit in December 8th, 1876. She basically called him the next day, okay. Um, it was tried in the divorce of Grant on February 3rd. The first charge was that he was guilty of adultery and voluntary sexual intercourse with a female named Margaret McBride. He admitted their home, however, they had everything crossed out in the paragraph. Um, and then, let's see, it was going. And then she also accused him of, where is it? In the papers of modern period cruelty. Oh no, that's his second wife. Okay, she, uh, she, 
<laughs> we'll talk about a second one. She accused him of assault, a battery, and a lot of other things. So they ended up settling. She got a settlement, as you can see, of $30,000 in gold coin and a division of certain real estate. And, and Carmel received no alimony, okay? So um, then Fallon remarried again, we'll just mention it because it's here, to Samantha. Um, and then her, and when she divorced him, she divorced him as well, she said basically the same thing. There's bodily injury, assault, you know, he was insanely jealous, he wouldn't let her leave the house, you know, all these kinds of things. So then he's, um, he settled with her too. I forget how, it, was it in there? Settlement for him. They, she didn't get that much because what happened was he kind of squandered his money after Carmel left and he didn't do as well, but Carmel did very well. Okay, so let's go on to Carmel. So Carmel started over in San Francisco and she was a savvy businesswoman, a real estate investor. She acquired a tremendous amount of wealth and she built the Hotel Carmel Fallon Hotel in 1800 Market Street. These are all historic buildings that are in, in San Francisco, especially the 1800 Market Street. You see it a lot in, because it's in the Castro District and it's where the, um, it's always brightly painted. You see the, um, the rainbow flag and stuff. You see it a lot, you'll see a picture of it. She later made a generous pledge to San Francisco Opera House, which bears a plaque in her name. Now this, um, this big pledge that she made to the Opera House, it was actually um, the Opera Foundation or whatever ended up suing her estate because what happened was she made this big pledge and then she passed away and then I guess her, her executors did not give money and so they actually sued for the money. But it wasn't when she was alive, it was after she had passed away. And then, but the plaque bears her name, okay, so. So that's the Fallon building in the Castrodix, and that's Carmel again. And then, and then, and then that's it. Is that it? <laughs> and there's so much more to tell about the Castros because I really just kind of picked on two people, but they were mayors, they were governors, they were, they were very, very involved in all California. So this is just, if you could believe it, just a touch of their history. So. Thank you. Thank you. So we are ready to eat. So those of you that um, purchased your lunch, it is sitting right back there right now. Thank you so much. <laughs> cool. Dr. George Castro. Any comments about the hawk? Yeah, I, I never knew much about that, that branch of Castro's, uh, other than seeing the name. Uh, I'm the only uh, old Californian that I've uh, ever met was actually on the phone. And she was Maria Berriesa de Castro. And she lived somewhere on 10th Street. And she, call, she called me because I was running for her school board at uh, City College, and she didn't want her taxes raised because she has on a, living in a pension. And uh, that's the only one I knew. Uh, uh, I traced my family to Mexico uh, back to 1840. Yeah. And what year did you meet Mrs. Berryessa? This would be about 1970. She called me up. I don't know where she got my number. Oh, I was probably listening. And she asked me about the name. And, uh, yeah. So interesting. Yeah. about everything. Yes. <laughs> you can do a whole entire talk on just Mexican land grants. You yes. know what I mean? I wanted to tell you, I know I'm in California for six years, mm -hmm. and I know nothing about California history, and this was a terrific summary oh, of, yes. of the area. I was, I thought it was a terrific presentation. Oh, thank you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Really, really so much. I wanted to say Wonderful. much the same thing. Oh, thank you. Really thank you. I do, um, I do the history. Should I give a or two? Yeah, they all fight a bit.
I'll just give one.